Neely has worked on PXE for the past 14 years. Uh, she's currently in the laboratory with Yoni Witu, who uh, presented our previous webinar. Uh, anybody here was in attendance for that one. Uh, they're both part of the PXC International Center of Excellence at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Um, PXC has enjoyed supporting her and working with her, and we're excited to hear her talk today about uh, mouse models and modifier genes for PXC. So Lily, if you want to take it away? Yeah. Thank you, Sam, for the kind introduction. Um, the title of the webinar today is called the Mouse Models and Modifier Genes for PXE. As Sam said, Jefferson Dermatology is home to the PXE International Center of Excellence in Research and Clinical Care. This center was established here at Jefferson Dermatology in 2016 in collaboration with PXE International. Pseudoxanthema elasticum, short for PXE, is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. It is characterized by connective tissue mineralization in three organ systems, the skin, the eyes, and the cardiovascular system. PXE is late onset and a slowly progressive disorder. The estimated prevalence is about one in 50,000. Here are the clinical findings. Um, the cutaneous lesions are usually small yellowish papules uh, on the predilection size at the flexural areas such as the back of the neck here. And these lesions progressively coalesce into larger plaques of inelastic and leathery uh, 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 skin. If you take a skin biopsy here from the lesional skin and we see fragmented uh, elastic fibers and mineral deposits in the mid-dermis. So the presence of mineral deposition is a characteristic histopathology feature for PXE. PXE also affects the eye and is called angiod streaks. And this is the vascular calcification here from a, a left renal artery collected from a uh, autopsy from a patient who has bad allelic ABCC6 mutations here. This is HE staining. Um, and you see the dark purple material uh, is uh, the calcified plaque. On the red hand, this is the uh, macro CT scan showing the calcified uh, proximal and distal arteries in the lower legs of a patient. And this is the standard non-invasive way to monitor on uh, artery calcification uh, in patients. PXE is caused by mutations in the ABCC6 gene. This gene was mapped originally by linkage analysis in families with PXE. And this gene was found to harbor disease causing mutations. Up to date, there are over 300 distinct mutations that have been disclosed in this gene. The types of mutation include those at the bottom, those nine sense mutation. On the top, there are the splicing, insertion, deletion mutations. At the very bottom, there are large deletion mutations in the ABCC6 gene. There are also a number of missense mutations, and they are the amino acid substitutions uh, in the protein. The protein is translated to a full length, but there are point amino acid substitutions. The ABCC6 gene encodes a protein called ABCC6. It's called ATP binding cassette family C member six. It is a member of a family of ATP binding cassette proteins. There are 48 proteins in the human, and those proteins usually utilize energy generated from ATP hydrolysis and transport a wide variety of substrates across cell membranes. So those proteins are here at the bottom. They are transmembrane proteins. There are two intracellular here. Uh, ATP bending the maze, which are very critical from the function of the protein to behave like a uh, transmembrane transporter. Based on sequence homology with its close relative uh, ABCC1, 
the ABCC6 protein is thought to be a efflux protein, transmembrane transporter, meaning that the protein uh, is likely to transport, transport some molecules from the liver to the blood circulation. However, that molecule, uh, if it exists, uh, that would be transported by ABCC6 protein uh, is not known. So the webinar today deals with a puzzling in PXE, which is phenotypic heterogeneity. PXE is a late onset, slowly progressive disorder. The natural history and the natural progression of the disease is not very clear. PXE has considerable intra and interfamiliar variability. In some families, involvement of one of the organ systems, such as the skin, predominates, while in others, the eye or cardiovascular manifestations are more profound. In addition, while well, I said there are over 300 mutations have been found in ABCC6, so far there's no clear uh, genotype phenotype correlation that would explain the phenotypic heterogeneity. In addition, two extreme ends of a phenotype were encountered in, uh, in family members in the same family. For example, this paper here reported two patients in the same family, and the older brother developed PXE, while the younger brother died of a very unusual severe vascular case, and he died at 15 months of age. Uh, finally, the same ABCC6 mutations, the same one, the same position, the same type of mutation in ABCC6 can cause both PXE and the GACI. So these observations um, indicate a substantial gap of our standing as to the factors that would modulate the phenotypic uh, differences in patients with the PXE. As early as 2001, Dr. Rito published a paper in Transmolecular Medicine and at that time, he suggested that PXE is a primary metabolic disorder at the environment genome interface. There are genetic factors, environmental factors, dietary factors that can all modify the disease progression and disease severity. The ABCC6 knockout mouse serves as a very useful model to study human PXE. And this mouse was made by targeted deletion of the corresponding uh, ABCC6 gene in the mouse genome. Those mouse, the homozygous mouse, develop mineralization here in the skin, in the retina, and in the arterial blood vessels. So in the skin, the eyes, and the cardiovascular system, which is very similar to patients with PXE, and this mouse, this mouse mimics the human uh, PX features. In this mouse, only one early and reliable biomarker of the overall mineralization process is vibrissae mineralization. So here, this is one vibrissa. So vibrissa is the plural. So one vibrissa in the muscle skin is a special type of hair follicle that is becoming mineralized as early as five to six weeks of age in the ABCC6 knockout mice. So this is a hair follicle, this is the hair shaft, and this is sinus, and this is the dermal shape. This is a connective tissue capsule that becomes mineralized in the ABCC6 knockout mice. In many of our studies, and we can determine the degree of mineralization in this mouse model by two independent analyses. We can collect one piece of model skin here, and we can do semi-quantitative histopathologic evaluation of mineralization in the vibrissae. We can also collect another piece of model skin here, and we can use a calcium chemical assay to quantitate the amount of calcium in the piece of muscle skin. So here are more uh, HE staining, which is a standard histological stain. Uh, here on the left is the wild type of mouse, and this is a normal uh, hair follicle. Uh, there's no calcification. On the red upper panel, and this is ABCC6 knockout, 
and you see the connective tissue capsule here has a loss of uh, mineralization, which is stained uh, dark purple. This is, a, this is a special histological stain called alizarin red, which is specific for calcium. And you see all the red here uh, is uh, uh, mineralization. So the mineralization here is actually calcification. So it is made of a calcium and phosphate complex. And here comes another special stain for mineralization. This is called Fancasa staining. So the mineralization is stained uh, dark black here. And what you see here is that the mineralization in the Vibrisi is progressive. And uh, the older the animals get, and the more calcification um, they develop. And this is also similar to patients with PXE. So besides the ABCC6 genetically and, uh, engineered the most model of PXE, and there are now uh, four additional MOS strains that also develop PXE-like uh, mineralization phenotype. And this study really goes back to 10 years ago. And uh, on the upper um, panel, this is John Sandberg, who is a well-known geneticist and pathologist working at the Jackson Laboratory in Bahabur, Maine. At that time, he conducted a large-scale aging study that involves 31 mouse inbred strains. So the webinar today is really a collaborative uh, effort uh, between our group here at Jefferson and uh, John Sandberg at the Jackson Laboratory. So on the left, this is the mouse family tree. And there are different groups and there are different uh, strains. And all the here and all the highlighted strains, they are the 31 strains, they represent the most commonly used MOS strains used in biomedical research today. So what, so what we have done uh, in those 31 strains is the, here is the following. Since this is an aging study and we want to follow up their phenotypes when they age. So the project is divided into longitudinal lifespan study and the cross-sectional study. So in the longitudinal study, we have 64 females, 32 males for each strain, and those animals were uh, examined uh, physiologically at 6, 12, 18, and 24 months of age, and the necropsies were performed on, on moribund mice. So we allow the mice age until they die naturally, and they were uh, euthanized and the tissues collected. In the cross-sectional study, 15 females and 15 males for each strain, and uh, the necropsis were performed at 6, 12, and 20 months of age. So this is a very large scale uh, aging study uh, performed at the Jackson Laboratory. This table uh, shows the number of mice that were euthanized at different time points. So here we have female, we have male here, and the mice were euthanized at six months, 12, 20 months, and until they die. So we euthanized a total of uh, 1,742 mice, and we basically collected uh, all tissues, skin, the eyes, the bones, everything. And each mouse, we have about, we have 24 slides. And we put, uh, uh, we cut, thin sections of the tissue, and we put tissues on a glass, and we do histologic examination. And each slide uh, contains uh, multiple organs. And uh, so at the end, so we have about 41,000 slides. If we add up some special stainings and immunohistochemistry, we have about 50,000 uh, slides uh, to evaluate. Here, this is a sled box. So this is a 100 sled box. So if there are 24 slides per mouse, and we can put slides from four miles in one box, and if we have 50,000 slides, and you can calculate, we have 500 of those sled boxes. And John Sandberg will uh, review them. So the study is to determine the type and the diversity of diseases must develop as they age using histopathology. 
and there are about 800 phenotypes in different organs, we are particularly interested in a phenotype called the tissue mineralization. So this is John Sandberg. So he's the mouse pathologist, and uh, he reviewed all the slides, and he wrote pathology report. And he tells on this mouse what is, what is going on in the liver, what is going on in the skin. So this is the first slide that uh, uh, came to John. So this is a rebreather in the muscle skin. This is the standard HE staining. And you see here on the left and on the right side, and you see, wow, this is a mineralization. And this phenotype is very similar to what we saw in our ABCC6 knockout mice that also calcify in the dermal sheets of uh, Vibrisi. And this mouse, we go back to the uh, inventory, and this slide came from a mouse strain called KK slash H1J. This KK mouse strain also developed mineralization in the eye, in the uh, arterial blood vessels, and you see this is a, uh, a blood vessel, and they are all the calcifications. KK mouse also develop mineralization uh, in the lung and in the heart. So this is the, uh, a section of the heart, and uh, this is epicardial mineralization, and you see this uh, mineralization and the fibrosis, and this is a closer up view of fibrosis and the mineralization. And this is myocardial uh, mineralization here and here, and you see the better with the high magnification here and here. So KK developed multi-system mineralization, the muscle skin, the uh, vascular system, on the eye, the lung, and the heart. So what is the translational relevance? And the phenotype is similar to the ABCC6 knockout mouse model of PXE with the underlying gene being ABCC6. So that prompted us to look at sequence variations in the ABCC6 gene in the uh, KK. So not only in KK, there are three other strains and they are called 129, C3H, and DBA, and together with the KK, there are a total of four strains, and they develop some sort of uh, highly variable um, PXE phenotype. So we looked at the ABCC6 haplotypes here, and there are a number of uh, uh, haplotype patterns, and we are interested, for example, here, in the four strains that develop PXE mineralization phenotype, they all have A allele, while all the other strains that are negative for the PXE mineralization phenotype have G allele. And that G to A uh, allele change translates to a arginine to cysteine substitution as the amino acid uh, level. And to determine the consequence of that uh, arginine to cysteine substitution, we looked at the ABCC6 transcript. So on the MR level, for example, and we PCR amplified the transcript, and in the B6, so this is the B6, this is the wild type for ABCC6, and the negative for mineralization had one bind here, while in KK, containing that ABCC6 mutation, it has two bands, and it has a, a smaller band that is slightly smaller and than the band in the um, wild type mouse. And we are able to confirm that the smaller band here is actually have five nucleotide deletion as compared to the wild type strain. So here you see the uh, Sanger sequencing Sanger sequences from the B6. So here we call it the B6. Here we call it the KK. So here it is a C allele in B6, and it is U because this is the pre-MR level, and this is the KK. And we showed by sequencing of the genomic DNA and the cDNA that this C to U change causes a GU 
a new supplying donor site. So instead of supplying from the supplying donor and the select uh, supplying receptor, now the DEU creates a new supply site. And so now it supplies with the supply receptor. So the last five nucleotides from the end of exon 14 um, was deleted. And that was confirmed by Sanger sequencing of the CDNA um, from the KK. So what is the consequence of the ABCC6 protein at the, uh, at the protein level? So we use the ABCC6 specific antibody and we stand the liver sections from the ABCC6 wild type and ABCC6 knockout mice and the liver section from KK. And you see here, this is immunofluorescence that uh, stains the ABCC6 protein in the ABCC6 wild type mice on the left. And you, we see a very nice plasma membrane localization. The bottom panel here uh, is better. You see that the blue is a nuclei and uh, the ABCC6 protein is stained on the plasma membrane surface. And that staining was not appreciated in the ABCC6 knockout and in KK. So the ABCC6 protein level is significantly reduced in the uh, KK mouse. So we went further to quantify the ABCC6 protein level by Western blood from liver uh, protein lecid here. So if you look at the bar graph shown in panel B, the KK, DBA, C3H, and 129, they are the four strains carry the same ABCC6 mutation. And as compared to here, this is 100. This is the ABCC6 protein level in the B6 uh, mice. And the ABCC6 protein level in the, all the four strains is reduced to about 30% uh, of the wild type. So those, now those strains um, provide uh, novel models to study uh, human PXE. So if we put all the 31 strains together, uh, this bar graph shows you um, which strain develop uh, with breathe mineralization and which strain does not. And uh, the red highlighted, so the four strains, the C3H, TBA, 129, KK here, they are the four strains carry the same ABCC6 mutation. However, KK develop the most early onset and develops the most severe PXE phenotype. This 129 here strain develops with breathing mineralization in old, close to two year old mice only. While the C3H and DBA, those two strains develop very little, if any, uh, with breathing mineralization. Uh, in two-year-old mice. However, those four strains here, as we uh, highlighted, KK, DBA, C3H, and 129, they all develop mineralization. If we place those mice on a so-called acceleration diet, so this is an experimental diet that contains high levels of phosphate and low levels of magnesium. We have shown in the ABCC6 knockout mice here that this modified diet really speeds up the mineralization process. And it also speed up and exacerbate the degree of mineralization in all the four strains. Now the DBA and the C3H strain, now they were negative for mineralization on regular child, even at two years of age, now start to develop um, calcification on the so-called acceleration diet. But the disease severity remains the same. Again, the KK develops the most severe, and the DBA, C3H, very mild, and the 129 in intermediate uh, levels. So if we compare the four strains, the KK, 129, C3H, and DBA, and this is the, early, this is the onset and the severity. KK developed the most severe, very early onset, uh, as early as five to six weeks of age, the C3H and DBA develop very little, if any, even at two years of age. 129 develops intermediate levels of mineralization phenotype, and all four strains have the same ABCC6 mutation. 
the B6 strain is normal. It is wild type for ABCC6 and negative for PXE mineralization phenotype. As all the inbred strains were maintained under identical environmental conditions, the variability in phenotypic severity among those four strains with the same ABCC6 allelic mutation suggests that genetic factors regulate the phenotypic presentation in these four strains. As Dr. Vito published, PXE is a metabolic disorder uh, at the environment genomic uh, interface. Now we can really utilize those four inbred strains to dissect out environmental factors and we can focus on the genetic factors that can uh, modify the disease phenotype. So how to uh, identify those genes? So we call them modifier genes in mice. So PXE is a Mendelian disorder or monogenic disorder. PXE is caused by here uh, mutations in the ABCC6 gene. So now we are looking at genes here, the modifying gene that would uh, modify the disease onset and the progression and the disease severity in the presence of the disease causing ABCC6 mutations. And the strain variation of ectopic mineralization makes it a very useful quantitative trait for genetic analysis. To identify those genes in mice, we performed uh, QTL analysis. QTL is short for quantitative trait locus analysis. The analysis is a traditional MOS genetics approach to identify chromosome regions that contain uh, genetic factors that modify the, the phenotype. The QTL analysis can, so we set up crosses here. Basically the idea is to cross. It is a two-step cross. So we set up two crosses here. In the first cross on the left, we crossed the KK, which is the severely affected PXE with the ABCC6 mutation. We crossed that with B6, which is a wild type for ABCC6 and uh, negative for mineralization. We also set up another, a second cross. We crossed the KK and the DBA. Both the trains carry the same ABCC6 allelic mutation, but the KK developed the most severe PXE, while DBA had a very mild PXE phenotype. And uh, from the cross, we generated uh, their respective F1. So now we looked at the F1 phenotype because QTL is a two step. We would like to know whether the second step would be a back cross or intercross. So by looking at the F1 phenotype, here the bar graphs, the y axis are the calcium content in the muscle skin determined by a calcium chemical assay. So the x axis are the three parental strains and we had in the two crosses. So KK, B6, and the F1s from uh, um, two crosses. And you see from the bar graph here, there are lots of calcification, lots of calcium in the KK. And there are some baseline levels of calcium in B6 and DBA. If you look at their respective F1s, and the amount of calcium is similar to the parental B6 or DBA2. And that suggests that there are recessive genes present in the parental strains in KK that cause uh, the mineralization phenotype. And therefore, we did a back cross study. So we crossed the F1 hybrid mice with the parental KK. And from there, we generated two N2 um, progeny uh, group. And from each N2 group, we generated about 200 mice in each group. So here we have two crosses. Uh, it is vected from the first cross, from the KKB6 cross, that we would be able to identify ABCC6 as a strong uh, genetic determinant for PXE because KK has the allelic ABCC6 mutation, the B6 is a wild type. In addition, since KK and DBA both have the same allelic mutation, 
So it is very likely that additional genes would be uh, identified because now we can rule out the influence of ABCC6 from this group. And that allows us to identify additional genes rather than ABCC6 as a uh, modifier gene. So when the N2 mice were generated, we placed those mice on the acceleration diet for a total of eight weeks. And without this acceleration diet, uh, this study would otherwise take us uh, uh, two years to complete to see phenotype differences. So this acceleration diet really speed up the phenotype and shorten the time required for the mice to develop a reliable uh, mineralization phenotype. So at the end of the study, we have about 402 mice. We have the three parental strains. We have their respective two F1 hybrid mice. And the QTL analysis requires two critical components. We need a genotype and we need a phenotype from each mouse to identify the genes. For genotype, we collected a piece of a, a tail sample. And from there, we isolated the genomic DNA and uh, we performed the giga muga SNP genotyping array consisting of about uh, uh, 140,000 proofs across the mouse genome. For phenotyping, we collected the muscle skin, the kidney, heart, aorta, the eyes, and the lungs. And the tissues were collected and they were processed and they were uh, cut and they were placed on a glass slide and John Sandberg reviewed them and the degree of mineralization was graded in a scoring system. So here, they are from one to four scale. If the score is zero, it is normal. There's no calcification. Score one, mild, two, moderate, three, severe, and four, extreme. So now I will show you a few examples. This is Vibrisa mineralization in the muscle skin. Here on the top, and you see the score zero, negative, there's no calcification here, and the score one, two, three, four. And you can see very little here, and there's more, and severe, and here extreme, okay? And at the bottom, this is the phenotype distribution. And you see the dot, and each dot is one mouse. On the y-axis, there are the phenotype scores from zero to four. On the x-axis, and we have the strains, KK, B6, D2, they are the three parental strains. And this B6, KK cross the F1, D2, KK cross F1, and there are corresponding N2 progeny. And if we look at the three parental strains, the KK develop the most severe uh, mineralization phenotype in the Vibrisi. And the B6 and D2 are negative. They have score zero. And if you look at the two N2 progeny group, and you see very nice uh, distribution, and this is a quantitative trait and the scores are from zero to four. So the girls are represented by red and the boys are represented by blue. And again, each dot is a mouse. Here we have 200 mice here and we have about 200 mice here. So now we have the phenotype data and the genomic DNA in each mouse was genotyped. So what, what is the genetics? Here, this is what the, the genetics shows up. So this is the Vibrisa QTL. And the Y is the load score, and this is the load of the odds ratio. And on the X axis are the chromosomes. So the mouse has 19 uh, chromosome and, uh, and then the X chromosome. So here, there's a strong QTL on chromosome seven in KK and B6 cross. And that load score is 15. So this is a very strong uh, QTL here on chromosome seven containing ABCC6. If we look at the KK D2 cross, there's no significant QTL that is above the threshold. 
And that QTL we see in the KKB6 cross was lost in the KKD2 cross because both KK and D2 contain the same ABCC6 mutation. So the linkage was lost uh, here in the KK and D2 cross. So this is Vibrisi mineralization. What about other tissues? Here is the aorta. So this is all normal aorta, uh, negative for calcification. This is the aorta with mineralization, and very few mice develop mineralization. So there is no good phenotype data for genetics work. This is the long mineralization, and we have a score from zero to two. And this is the phenotype, phenotype distribution. Uh, the girls are red, the boys are blue, and this is the genetics. There is a QTL on chromosome 7 containing ABCC6 in KKB6 cross, and that linkage was lost in KKD2. And the same thing for the eye mineralization. We have score from 0 to 3, and the phenotype distribution at the bottom, and you see a quantitative trait in the N2 mice. The genetics, again, a strong QTL on chromosome 7 uh, in KKB6 cross, and negative in the KK on D2. So here comes the heart, and this is interesting. So score from zero to three at the bottom is the phenotype distribution. Here's the QTR. Again, we see a strong QTR on chromosome seven containing ABCC6 here, and that linkage again was lost in KKD2 cross. Now we see a, another QTR here on chromosome three uh, in KKD2 cross. And this is the kidney mineralization, uh, score zero, one, two, three, four. And this is the phenotype distribution, and you appreciate here the quantitative trait in the N2 progeny. The QTL, strong QTL on chromosome seven, and that linkage was lost in KKD2. Now we see additional QTL, second QTL in KKB6 on chromosome five. And that chromosome five QTL becomes more stronger, becomes stronger here if the chromosome seven QTL was removed uh, in KKD2 mice. So our QTL analysis confirmed ABCC6 as a major genetic determinant for ectopic mineralization in multiple organ systems. Now we have three unresolved QTR, and we have one heart QTR on chromosome three, and two overlapping uh, QTR for kidney mineralization on chrom chromosome five. And those three QTR contain genes, modifier genes on four PXE phenotype. So how do we identify genes from those uh, chromosome intervals? This is our bioinformatics pipeline. So we started from the top, the whole mouse genome has about 30,000 genes. And now, because we have a chromosome interval on chromosome three or chromosome five, now we ask the question, how many genes are actually in that QTR interval? And next, we ask whether the gene is expressed in the heart or in the kidney. And at the end, we ask whether there are any SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphism differences between the parental uh, strains. So at the very end, at, uh, at the bottom, we identified two genes on chromosome three and five and seven candidate modifier genes on chromosome five. So this is the hierarchy chart, and that really demonstrates how the modifier genes were identified. So now it flows from the bottom to the very top. So there are two genes on chromosome three, and here are seven candidate modifier genes on chromosome cell. If we put them all together into a table, so here the two genes on chromosome three, and there are a total of seven genes on chromosome five, and one gene here interacts with ABCC6, and then this card two gene here has been previously associated uh, with mineralization phenotype. And if we put all the genes together into a ectopic mineralization network, so we have nine candidate modifiers that were identified in this study. And there are 22 known genes when they are mutated in human and mouse cause ectopic mineralization phenotype. So now we generated a ectopic mineralization network containing uh, all these genes now together 
controls the ectopic mineralization network. So this is a summary. In addition to the ABCC6 knockout mice, mouse inbred strains carrying spontaneous ABCC6 hypermorphic allele serve as novel models of PXE. And those strains provide tools to dissect genetic factors which modify the PXE phenotype. QTL analysis confirmed ABCC6 as a major genetic determinant for ectopic mineralization in multiple organs. Integrity analysis identified nine candidate modifier genes for organ-specific ectopic mineralization in mice. At the end, PXE, a rare heritable disorder, serves as a genetic model for common ectopic mineralization disorders. So this is a collaborative project uh, with the Univito here at uh, Jefferson Dermatology and John Sandberg at the Jackson Laboratory. And Ben King at the University of Maine performed the bioinformatics analysis. And the project was supported by PXC International. OK, Sam, thank you very much. Thank you, Lily. I'm going to unmute everybody. Uh, and you guys can ask questions if you have any. And just try to go one at a time if you hear someone else speaking up uh, so we don't have a lot of people talking over each other on the recording, OK? Uh, it's Anna here. Sorry, I can't turn my video on, so I'm sorry if you can't see me. Um, thank you, Lily. That was really interesting, although I only followed probably half of it, I have to say. It's very complex. Um, I just have a question about the um, acceleration diet that you mentioned. You said that the diet, I understood you said that the diet was high in phosphates and low in magnesium. Is yes. that correct? That's correct. Um, then why, I, I know that there's a, a strain of research for PXC on increasing pyrophosphate intake. Um, so I, I kind of can't understand how that the diet could be low in magnesium and high in phosphate if in fact research is indicating that a high pyrophosphate diet might be helpful with PXC. What am I missing? So you are talking about the high pyrophosphate or phosphate? Uh, well, I, I, I don't really understand the difference between the two, but I assumed that high phosphate would have some equivalence with pyrophosphates. Is that incorrect? Um, no. So phosphate, phosphate is a pro-mineralization factor. Mm -hmm. Pyrophosphate, so it has the two phosphate bond. It mm -hmm. is the anti-mineralization factor. Right. So... So high levels of phosphate uh, increase the, uh, the amount of calcification, while high levels of pyrophosphate would be uh, preventive. Okay, okay. So, Does that... Sorry, go on. Yeah, because ABCC6 uh, knock out mice and patients uh, with PXE have reduced levels of pyrophosphate and right. because the pyrophosphate level is low and the patients are uh, uh, calcified. So phosphate uh, is a pro-mineralization factor and the pyrophosphate is an anti-mineralization factor. Okay so while there's some indication that we should possibly be increasing magnesium in our diet, does that mean that we should also be look to, looking to um, decrease phosphate intake? Increase pyrophosphate intake. Yeah, but n not not decrease phosphate. Well, yeah, so increase increase pyrophosphate, not uh, phosphate. So yeah, yeah. so Andras Waradi group in Hungary, uh, Budapest, Hungary published a paper uh, two years ago, and he showed in the mouse model in the ABCC6 and the ENPP1 mutant mouse model that uh, uh, if the mice were treated with pyrophosphate in drinking water and that significantly reduced the mineralization in the mouse models. And he also showed in human healthy volunteers that by, by, drink, by, drink, uh, by uh, drinking water containing pyrophosphate, that the pyrophosphate is absorbed uh, in the blood circulation. So presumably, uh, increasing pyrophosphate in the blood circulation can uh, prevent or stop progression of this, this disease. We actually have a grant application uh, in our proposal and that uh, um, we are planning um, with Sharon Terry that in the near future, 
um, we will perform a, a pilot a clinical trial study uh, in controls and patients with PXE and for them to, uh, to take pyrophosphate in drinking water and we will follow up its absorption. But, but while that, that the accessibility of pyrophosphates presently isn't, um, well, it's not accessible um, in large doses, so we can't actually trial it for ourselves, um, I was wondering if the equivalent of that would be to reduce phosphate in the diet. Reduce phosphate. Because mm. if you increased phosphate for an acceleration diet, doesn't it follow that reduced phosphate might have some impact on mineralization in a positive way? Yeah, there are there are anecdotal um, uh, studies I think uh, who published. Uh, Doctor Lab Labwa, he published studies um, with phosphate benders. So they are Renagel, for example, which bends phosphate. So it's phosphate bender, and uh, he claimed that uh, it is beneficial for patients with PXE. But we have not really uh, performed a well, very well controlled uh, study in our MOS models. We have not done that. Mm -hmm. But we know increasing the uh, phosphate and the lower the magnesium content can exacerbate the disease phenotype. Okay. So thank you, you can. So maybe you can think about on the other, <laughs> you know, end. If you want to lower uh, phosphate and increase magnesium, can be helpful. Okay. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. You said magnesium. I just got into the, uh, I just um, just joined right now, but how, how many, how much magnesium, how, how many milligrams would you suggest to take? Um, the FDA recommended um, those, if I remember, is 425 milligram per day. And the, uh, the recent clinical trial, the magnesium clinical trial, if I remember it is a double, double the FDA uh, recommended dose. And uh, I heard from the, uh, the presentation given last year that uh, the the double the amount of uh, uh, magnesium intake uh, associated with some uh, GI uh, disturbance, some side effects. But in our oh, model, me, it, uh, I didn't quite get uh, the last sentence, what you said. Oh, OK. So the FDA recommended the 425 milligram. The clinical trial yeah. uses a double. I think it's 425 uh, times two. Okay, that's doubles the FDA recommended dose. And even double the dose cause some GI disturbance uh, in patients. And some patients have to uh, um, stop uh, in the middle of the trial. Oh, okay. Stomach, some stomach disturbance. What kind of uh, magnesium would you, uh, what kind of magnesium were they taking? I think it is magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide. Oh, I see. Okay. I have to, yeah, I have to double check with that. Yeah. I think that's what uh, Dr. Uh, Uitol, the one uh, previously was saying magnesium oxide too, but I wasn't uh, quite sure, so I was just confirming. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I remember yeah. It's magnesium oxide. And we also use magnesium oxide in our mouse studies that prevents PXE in the mouse model. Okay. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. I have another question if nobody else before sure. this one. Um, it was in relation to the, the variations, the mutation variations in the mice that you described, have they also been identified in humans, all of those? For the same amino acid position, no. So does that mean that all of the research that you're doing currently on mice with these modifier genes may or may not be applicable to humans um, at this stage because you haven't identified those same mutations? Well, that's a good question. So, so yes, the, the mutation in the mouse 
does not really, the same mutation does not exist that have not been found in human patients. Mm -hmm. But if we are talking about the modifier genes that we found in mice, they may be applicable to human patients because there's a significant stiffening between the human and the mouse genome. And, uh, but however, that has to be tested mm -hmm. in, the, in the future. Mm -hmm. So there's a long way to go <laughs> to people. Okay, thank you. Sure. I just wanted to ask some, um, uh, you know, supplemental supplement uh, question, but I don't, uh, is, if that's okay, if what kind of supplements I should be taking besides the calcium oxide not calcium, excuse me, magnesium oxide. Uh, supplement. Uh, I don't think there are uh, recommendations as to um, what kind of supplement. Um, I don't think there are recommendations at the moment. But we, okay. at, this moment, okay. at this moment, we know, we know magnesium, um, pyrophosphate, uh, maybe helpful. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap up tonight? Okay. If no one has anything else to say, I'm going to just wrap it up. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Lily, for your presentation. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. much. Okay. Better to do. Better to do. Thank you, guys. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.